white immigrants can come to this country 50 years ago with nickels and dimes and no education and come here and pool their little nickels and dimes and no education into, with, and set up little stores, develop these stores into larger stores, develop this into an industry which creates job opportunities for whites. Since Lincoln was supposed to have freed the black man 100 years ago, and today the black man, according to the government economist, has spending power of $20 billion per year. We feel that with the black man spending $20 billion a year, not setting up any businesses, not creating any industry, not creating any job opportunities for his own kind, he's not in a moral position to point the finger today at the white man and tell the white man that he's discriminating against him for not giving him a job in factories that he has he himself set up. If the black man has $20 billion, and these so-called Negro leaders are such geniuses that they can integrate white restaurants and integrate white factories and integrate, force themselves into that which the white man has set up, they should use this same ingenuity to show the black people how to pool our wealth and set up something of our own. And then we won't have to force our way into his anymore. One more thing I would like to point out concerning what he said about 125th Street. We don't waste our time on 125th Street, but you can reach more people in the street who want to change than you can in the bourgeoisie society, the bourgeoisie church, and the bourgeoisie circles. We, our program is directed toward the man in the street. So we spend our time in the street, and what we do with that man, instead of trying to change the white man in your mind and make, uh, make you accept us, we change the mind of the black man and make him accept himself. And as soon as he accepts himself, He'll solve his own problem. He won't be trying to force himself into your factory and into your bedroom and into your kitchen. The scramble for Africa. Colonization was motivated by the European hunger for African resources subsequent exploitation of the African people and the uprooting of their spiritual values by Christian missionaries would leave a permanent European stamp on the continent. The mindset is the barbarians are backward and inferior and for their own benefit we have to uplift them and civilize them and educate them and so on. The uh, psychology behind it is kind of transparent. I mean, when you've got your boot on someone's neck and you're crushing them, you can't say to yourself, I'm a son of a bitch and I'm doing it for my own benefit. So what you have to do is figure out some way of saying I'm doing it for their benefit. And that's a, a very natural uh, position to take when you're beating somebody with a club. Britain cut the largest piece of African cake from Cairo to Cape Town, in addition to Nigeria and a few West African regions. It was also the British Empire that in 1894 imposed an arbitrary boundary around the many diverse ethnic groups and kingdoms that would make up Uganda. The southern Bantu-speaking people were given economic, political, and educational advantage. The northern ethnic groups, two in particular, the Acholi and the Langi, were the main recruits for military and police positions. By exploiting linguistic, ethnic, and cultural differences between the peoples of the north and south, Britain's divide and rule policies created a tension between them that helped maintain British rule. The French took an east-west slice of the continent, as well as Madagascar. The Belgians took Rwanda, Burundi, and the Congo in what Joseph Conrad called the vilest scramble for loot that ever disfigured the history of human conscience. Slave labor took over five million lives. In Rwanda, Belgium entrenched the idea of the Hutu as a workforce and the Tutsi as extenders of Belgian rule. The politicization of these two cultures would profoundly contribute to the genocide of 1994. In Sudan, the British ruled the Arabs in the north and the blacks in the south 
as separate colonies, only to combine the areas before independence in 1956. The result has been relentless civil war, the Darfur massacres being the latest tragedy. The Portuguese decimated Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau well into the 1970s. The Italians took Libya, Eritrea, and Somalia. The Germans added Cameroon and Tanzania and committed the first genocide of the 20th century against the Herero people. No colonial power uh, is going to succeed unless it's going to uh, play on existing divisions and sharpen them, increase them, exacerbate them. So one of the first questions after the end of colonialism is who belongs and who doesn't? Uh, who, who, who was part of the colonial struggle and who betrayed? And this is time to settle scores. After the Conference of Berlin in 1885, Europeans embarked on a continent-wide land grab. In less than 20 years, 90% of African territory would be placed under European colonial rule. One of the main beneficiaries was King Leopold II of Belgium. Aware of the vast fortune to be made, he persuaded Europe's powers to recognize his sovereignty over one of Africa's largest regions the Congo. Here was this man who became King of Belgium in 1865 at the age of 30. Uh, enormously shrewd, enormously greedy, enormously ambitious, uh, and with an absolutely brilliant sense of public relations. He hired the explorer, Henry Morton Stanley, the man who found Livingston, to go to the Congo and essentially stake out this huge territory for him. Leopold got first the United States and then all the major nations of Western Europe to ratify his seizure of this enormous territory in the center of the continent. First, Leopold created a smokescreen, claiming that he wished to educate a savage people. They were all really fooled by Leopold because they uh, took him at his word. They thought he was a sort of a man who's going to lose all his money in this crazy philanthropic venture. But they didn't realize what he was really after at all, which was to make himself hugely rich by exploiting brown hands and broad backs who were going to carry the wealth of Africa and load it on ships for his own personal profit. Bring them. Extreme violence was employed to impose Leopold's dominion. The right hands of those who failed to meet rubber quotas were severed. Even young children were not spared. In 1896, a German newspaper reported that 1,308 hands had been gathered in one day. Leopold created a 90,000 strong army to enforce his rule. One of his lieutenants wrote, only the whip can civilize the black. They would go into village after village. The army would seize the women of the village and hold them hostage in order to force the men of each village to go into the forest and gather a monthly quota of wild rubber. And they did this for about 20 years. And you can just very easily imagine if you have a village where the women are all being held hostage, the men are all in the forest as forced laborers for several weeks out of each month. There's nobody to plant and harvest food, to go hunting, to go fishing, to do all the normal things through which a community feeds itself. So from all of these causes, starvation, being worked to death, and most of all from the disease that hit this famine-ridden population, the best estimates are that between 1880, when King Leopold first got his hands on the Congo, and 1920, that in that 40-year period, the population was slashed from about 20 million at the beginning of that period to around 10 million at the end. So an enormous loss of human life.
huge building projects throughout Belgium were funded by Leopold's wealth to celebrate his reign. Leopold built himself a palace, now called the Museum of Central Africa, to display his spoils. For historian Bambi Koipins, whose father is Congolese, the building embodies the myths created to justify Belgian rule in the Congo. The central hall gives you the idea of what the museum is supposed to be about. You have the central dome through which the light falls on the heart of darkness underneath, you can say. Simultaneously, the dome also presents the sky, God, and then in the central hall, underneath that representation of Leopold II are uh, statues of Congolese. So what you really see were the hierarchical relationships that structured the relations between the colonized and the colonizers. As a human being, I'm obviously shocked by that because it is uh, very clear that uh, Africans the way that this museum was originally set up and the way that uh, most of the exhibitions still work are really dehumanized uh, because they were seen and represented as savages who really needed the help of outsiders, i.e. Europeans, to transform them into fully civilized human beings. From the late 19th century onwards, Human zoos exhibiting Africans in their primitive state became popular around Europe. One of the first was housed in the grounds of Leopold's museum. The Africans were put on display so people could go and see them in very much the same way that they could look at, say, caged animals in a zoo. And their reactions were also very similar. There were uh, notices saying that people were not allowed to throw peanuts uh, at the Africans because that was what they did. This museum is also, in a very real sense, the only monument to Belgian colonial history left in this country. So if we dismantle the museum, there is a very great danger that we also eradicate the public memory of that colonial heritage. And once that happens, of course, one paves the way for all these people who say, well, it was not as bad as that, was it? And Leopold II really did do a great deal of good. In 1908, the year before Leopold died, his crimes were made public, and he was forced to hand control of the Congo over to the Belgium government. But the cruelty continued. The forced labor system did not come to an end because it was so profitable. The new Belgian Congo continued it more or less until the early 1920s. At that point, the Belgian colonial officials realized that their population was shrinking so rapidly from the effects of the forced labor system that they had to modify it. They had to make it less lethal, or otherwise they would have no labor force left. Although 10 million people died, the Congolese genocide has largely been forgotten in Europe. In the book, The Heart of Darkness, the author, Joseph Conrad, who witnessed the violence in the Congo, writes, The conquest of the earth, which mostly means taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. When a series of missionary photographs arrived in England in the late 19th century, they caused outrage. The mutilations had been strategically photographed against white for maximum impact. The children came from the Congo, but the man accused of their suffering was white, European, and royal. For 100 years, evidence has lain dormant of one of the greatest mass murders. Millions of Africans died in one man's quest for wealth and glory. Until Adolf Hitler arrived on the scene, the European standard for cruelty was set by a king. Leopold II, King of the Belgians, was the personal owner of one million square miles of Central Africa and king sovereign of 20 million Africans. In the 1880s and 90s, the world outside Africa wanted rubber for its new bicycle and car industries, 
and Leopold's Congo Free State had the world's largest supply of wild rubber. The king had struck gold, black gold. He was determined to get as much rubber to Europe as he could, and as fast as he could. The rubber in this district has cost hundreds of lives. And the scenes I have witnessed while unable to help the oppressed have been almost enough to make me wish that I were dead. Over a period of 20 years, Leopold turned the Congo into a vast labor camp 80 times the size of Belgium, in the process making himself into one of the richest men in the world. As the number of deaths grew, so did his profits. This rubber traffic is steeped in blood. And were the natives to rise and sweep every white person on the upper Congo into eternity, there would still be left a fearful balance to their credit. White conquest is mythologized as benevolence, as bringing civilization to the Congo. Leopold's Congo was a prison state. Africans had no rights, no justice, and no freedom. They were there to serve a voracious European king. Thousands of miles away, Leopold was content that the end always justified the means, and the end was to make money. Going up that river was like traveling back to the earliest beginnings of the world, when vegetation rioted on the earth and the big trees were kings. An empty stream, a great silence, an impenetrable forest. The air was warm, thick, sluggish. There was no joy in the brilliance of sunshine. When prize-winning author Joseph Conrad wrote his novella Heart of Darkness, a journey into the terrifying depths of man's soul, he turned to the cruelest place on earth for inspiration, the Congo. It wasn't the Congo's inhabitants that made it that way. It was a ruthless succession of outsiders, beginning with Leopold II, a Belgian king with a lust for wealth and a passion for murder. Leopold was a very frustrated man as the king of a small country. And he had the conviction that to be worth anything in the world, a country had to have colonies. And he was a very single-minded man about that. King Leopold ascended the Belgian throne in 1865. Nine years later, an American explorer and journalist captivated the world with his stories of peril and pursuit in the farthest reaches of Africa. His name was Henry Morton Stanley. Stanley had discovered this area, which was the Congo, essentially. And he came back to Europe with the tales of what he'd seen there, the riches, the natural abundance, the, uh, the ivory, the rubber, the gum, the palms, the trees, the timber. And this got someone very excited. It basically excited King Leopold of Belgium. And he thought, that's what I want. Leopold was eager for his own piece of the African pie, which was being sliced up into colonies by other European powers. But he had no idea where to start. So in 1878, Leopold turned to Stanley, hoping the experienced explorer could help him take over the Congo. He did. One year later, Stanley was back in Africa as King Leopold's agent. He approached the Congo's tribal chiefs with land treaties and tricked over 500 of them into signing. Obviously, they couldn't read, they didn't know what it meant, and they sold their birthright for a few beads. It basically meant that they were handing over the rights to their land and the rights to trade, and they were handing that control over to King Leopold. Because what was extraordinary about the Congo was that it wasn't, at the beginning, a Belgian colony. It was essentially personal property of King Leopold II. While Stanley was in Africa, gobbling up a region 80 times the size of Belgium, Leopold was back in Brussels, figuring out how to make his gamble pay off. In 1879, Leopold created a private company whose stated mission was to free the Congolese people from foreign oppressors. 
namely Arab slave traders who were kidnapping native villagers and selling them into slavery abroad. Leopold assured the world his regime, which he called the Congo Free State, would bring prosperity and fair trade to the Congo. This, he said publicly, was the humanitarian thing to do, but his true goals were far different. Well, he didn't believe in free trade. Um, he didn't care at all for the indigenous population. He had absolutely no humanitarian ideals whatsoever. His aim was to create a colony for Belgium and, and make money. In 1887, a discovery made half a world away would be Leopold's lucky break. Scotsman John Dunlop developed a useful and inexpensive way to revolutionize travel, rubber tires. The Congo was one of only a handful of places in the world where rubber grew wild, and Leopold acted quickly to exploit it. He formed the Force Publique, an army of Belgians and Africans, and got them to force Congolese natives into rubber harvesting. It was dangerous work and required scaling the tops of trees where the valuable vines hung. Leopold's rush to corner the world's rubber market led to a whole new form of slavery in the Congo and a reign of terror so brutal it would become the worst genocide in African history. It began with a hard leather whip called a shikot. They would use the shikot to punish a Congolese villager who hadn't met his quota, and the shikot basically flayed open the, the skin so that apparently after 20 strokes, you were a bloody pulp. And if you had the misfortune to have uh, 50 strokes or 100 strokes, you died. So it became synonymous with uh, Leopold's rule, and it was uh, a horrible, feared instrument of torture. But to the outside world, the Congo seemed like a perfect colony, profitable, productive, and civilized, all thanks to King Leopold. <laughs> Meanwhile, inside the Congo, things went from bad to worse. When the rubber workers inevitably collapsed from exhaustion, starvation, or disease, the force publique shot them and were ordered to cut off their hands. The force publique were issued with bullets, and the officers who were commanding these mercenaries uh, wanted to see results. So for one of these soldiers not to get punished, if he was sent out with 10 cartridges, he had to have 10 hands of his victims. It's proof that he hadn't wasted his bullets. Often, of course, some of these bullets had been wasted, so there was this extraordinary pictures you get of living Congolese who, while they were still alive, had had their hands severed. Leopold set new standards in colonial brutality. I think he did that because he just was a man in a great hurry. Uh, and he didn't think of the Congolese as human. Few statistics were collected at the time, but estimates put the total number of murdered Congolese at well over 10 million. By 1901, the Congo was one of the world's largest rubber suppliers, and King Leopold profited handsomely. He lived the high life in Belgium and in several chateaus and villas throughout Europe. Leopold never set foot in what was ironically known as the Congo Free State, and I think that made it easier for him. He could uh, not look face to face with the evidence of what he had done to that country. This big uh, propaganda uh, ploy really managed to disguise what was really happening in Africa, and King Leopold was able to get away with it. You know, He was able to kill millions, but he still pretend that he was civilizing millions. Leopold might have prolonged his terror campaign had it not been for a curious and determined clerk in a Liverpool shipping office. His name was Edmund Morell. Morell looked at the shipping manifests and discovered that while a great deal of rubber and ivory was coming from the Congo, practically nothing was going back. Uh, the main uh, items which were carried in the ships going from Antwerp to the Congo were arms and ammunition, which obviously weren't going to be supplied to the Congolese. So that struck him as extremely suspicious. Once he suspected foul play, Morel was a man possessed. 
He quit his job and spent the next decade investigating King Leopold's corrupt regime. Morel was extraordinarily accurate. He was very adept at reading into the sort of boring statistics how much was coming out of the Congo in terms of resources. He would get documents leaked to him by people within Leopold's administration, people who did have consciences, who were concerned at what was going on. It was a moral issue, I think, for him. There was a robbery going on on a grand scale, and he disapproved. And Morel wasn't the only one watching the Congo. A British diplomat also issued a stinging indictment of King Leopold's system of slave labor, warning it would lead to the total extinction of the Congolese people. Faced with world suspicion, Leopold defiantly proclaimed, I will not allow myself to be soiled by blood or mud, and began an ambitious counter campaign. He would bribe journalists. Uh, he would uh, bribe US senators. He would invite people to go to the Congo and would make sure that while they were in the Congo, they only saw the nicest possible aspect of what was going on. So for every step that Morel took, King Leopold was up there meeting it and trying to neutralize it. But in 1902, profound literary work added its voice to the growing chorus against Leopold. Author Joseph Conrad worked as a sea captain's apprentice on the Congo River in 1890, during the height of the rubber massacres. Conrad was so transformed by the brutality and death he witnessed that he wrote it all down, and it became the basis for his seminal work, Heart of Darkness. Black shapes crouched, lay, sat between the trees, leaning against the trunks, clinging to the earth in all the attitudes of pain, abandonment, and despair. He was talking about the darkness which is at the heart of Westerners, white men who go out to places like Africa, and because they are far from their family, their friends, and the strictures of the society in which they have been brought up, they um, start behaving in ways that would have been inconceivable uh, if they were back home. They were dying slowly. It was very clear. They were not enemies. They were not criminals. They were nothing earthly now. Nothing but black shadows of disease and starvation, lying confusedly in the greenish gloom. Conrad intended it to be an absolute blast aimed at the imperialist colonialist system that had been set up in the Congo and the imperialist Congolese system that was being applied across Africa at that time. By 1908, the Belgian government was forced to confront the mounting claims of an African holocaust. To stem public outrage, it took the colony away from Leopold. The aging king was surprisingly relieved. Rubber sales had suddenly collapsed, and Leopold believed his days of fortune hunting in the Congo were over. By the time the Belgians stripped Leopold of his personal colony, his massive fortune was safely secured in a Swiss bank account. There's a common myth that once Leopold handed over the Congo to Belgium itself, that things improved enormously and it was fine and for the average Congolese living standards improved and they were treated as human beings. In fact, the difference was really not that obvious. And while rubber had become of no importance, the Belgians discovered that there was huge mineral resources under the soil in Congo. There was uh, copper, uh, gold. So the system of forced labor went from being applied to rubber to being applied to mineral resources. The Belgians renamed the country the Belgian Congo and ruled for the next 50 years. They boasted to the world of their help for the Congolese people and built churches, medical clinics, and elementary schools. Yes, in the Congo, other seeds have taken root. Seeds that can one day reach a full maturity. But there was a limit to how much the Congolese could achieve. Under Belgian rule, no native could vote. There was no system of higher education for blacks. And by 1956, among the 15 million people, there were just 17 college graduates. The Belgians had a motto, which was, if you keep the African ignorant and not educated, 
he won't present a potential problem. So they deliberately didn't encourage the Congolese to go very far in their education. It was all part of these savages are not ready to, to run themselves. It's a very patronizing approach of they need to be looked after. They're like children. They are a simple people. And to them, it's all a little strange, to say the least. They need understanding, patience, sympathy. The way Belgium was able to maintain the colonial structure during you know, the, the Congo Belge, during the, the Belgian Congo period, was through this colonization of the mind, that the white man is a better human being than the black man. And they pumped that message into the population through all forms of, of education, even in churches. And the people became sort of subdued and colonized internally in their mind. But in the late 1950s, that changed. After decades of European rule, Africans across the continent began demanding equal rights and independence. Revolts in colonial strongholds like Algeria and South Africa made the Belgians fear an uprising in their own colony. In 1960, after more than 50 years of domination and exploitation, Belgium abruptly pulled out of the Congo, leaving it a free country without a government. was surviving in what they considered to be a racist America. And we must remember also that these were depression years and that depression, depression years were even harder on blacks than they were on other people. So that the energies of American blacks were spent primarily on eking out a living, finding a job in depression America. As for the national policy, it had not changed in the 30s. America was still an isolationist country, remembering too vividly the First World War. Despite what happens in continents overseas, the United States of America shall and must remain as long ago the father of our country prayed that it might remain unentangled and free. Italian troops training at the Lease were set off to invade Abyssinia. Nucci was encouraged in his African venture. The League of Nations had taken no action in the Wall Wall controversy, and Mussolini was aware of a secret agreement between France and Britain not to interfere with his plans. On October 3, 1935, more than 250,000 Italian troops, complemented by thousands of well-trained Somali natives, crossed the northern and southern borders of Ethiopia. They advanced unchallenged for two days. From Addis Ababa, Selassie announced to the world that Italy was the aggressor. He fervently hoped that his barefoot soldiers with World War I weapons would be rescued from massacre by the League of Nations. His strategy was to send small units to the front at first and let the desolate mountain and desert terrain hold back the invaders. The first major confrontation was at Adawa, the site of the Italian defeat in 1896. Perhaps not since the invention of gunpowder had one army enjoyed such military supremacy. It took only four days for the fascist army to achieve victory and avenge their earlier humiliation. The war was marked by much pure savagery. Mussolini's mechanized army decimated Salazzi's primitive tribesmen. Francis Pierre Laval, whose secret agreement paved the way for Mussolini's conquest, guided the League of Nations toward the imposition of only mild sanctions against Italy. 
The League censured Italy as the aggressor and suspended all economic relations with her, but voted against sending arms or troops to Selassie. The vote satisfied the conscience of most European leaders who refused to see beyond the hypocrisy of their actions. For all intents and purposes, Ethiopia had been sacrificed. The fear of a potential alliance between Italy and Germany had paralyzed European statesmen. In un tempo in cui Roma aveva Cesare, Virgilio ed Augusto. Mussolini protested that his cause was just and resigned Italy from the League of Nations. World opinion turned against Italy. In England, where the public was revolted by Mussolini's bullyism and disgusted by the League's impotence, Italian-owned stores became targets for frustration and anger. Throughout American urban ghettos like New York's Harlem, angry blacks protested and smashed the windows of Italian shopkeepers. Nevertheless, government policy remained neutral. The United States is following a twofold neutrality towards any and all nations which engage in wars that are not of immediate concern to the Americas. First, we decline to encourage the prosecution of war by permitting belligerents to obtain arms, ammunition, or implements of war from the United States. Nations seeking expansion. FDR did manage to get Congress approval of a moral embargo on trade with Italy of all raw materials except oil. I think it would be quite fair to say uh, with hindsight certainly that the United States did very little to enforce any moral embargo other than making protestations and declarations. I think it's quite clear that had there been an effective embargo against oil for the Italian war machine that the Italian invasion would have had to come to a halt. Mussolini, with a free hand to pursue the war, ordered his army to conquer Ethiopia as quickly as possible. Marshal Badoli was put in charge and authorized to use any weapons or tactics necessary to win the war. This included mustard gas, though outlawed by the Geneva Convention. Badoglio, a witness to Billy Mitchell's demonstration of air power, now put the lesson to appalling use. Mussolini's brother Vittorio, a pilot, enjoyed killing from the air. These were his words. As the bomb fell in their midst and blew them up, one group of horsemen gave me the impression of a budding rose unfolding. Reports of poison gas, indiscriminate bombings, and other atrocities stunned the Western world. Mussolini's heroic image was tarnished by adverse, if not always accurate, press reports. There was a good deal of confusion in reporting the war because it was difficult to get to the site of the battles. Many of the reporters rushed over there with an adventurous sense of a romantic type of desert warfare, as though it would be a chapter out of T.E. Lawrence. Uh, they found out it was anything but that, and it was rather a dull and dragged out, essentially undramatic war. And as a result, a number of journalists began to fabricate stories. One consequence of that is they wrote news accounts which were definitely sympathetic to the Ethiopians and misled the public into believing that the Ethiopians were doing better than they actually were doing. So no one was prepared with the collapse of the uh, Haile Selassie's forces. <laughs> Mussolini was surprised by the speedy Italian success. Prepared for a six-year war, it ended in six months. The efficient Italian war machine devastated both Salazzi's primitive army and his primitive country. A gentle monarch was driven out of a land which, in the words of Winston Churchill, no conqueror in 4,000 years ever thought worthwhile to subdue. 
Emperor Selassie and his two sons were forced to flee before the Italians marched on his capital, Addis Ababa. About 700,000 Ethiopians were killed. About 2,000 Italians died. On May 9, 1936, Mussolini declared in Rome that Ethiopia now belonged to Italy. It was Mussolini's first conquest. It was also an early warning of fascist intentions, and America ignored the cry. It was held by Franklin Roosevelt that uh, eventually Il Duce would restore democratic processes and parliamentary forms of government so that our support for fascism, fascism was based on, I think, two fallacies. One was that fascism is the answer to communism, and secondly, fascism is a transit transitory episode that will eventually result in the restoration of democratic forms of government. Now, neither of these two assumptions proved to be the case. Salazzi was granted exile in the guilt-ridden but generous England. However, he demanded the opportunity to address the League of Nations as soon as possible, hoping to salvage at least his self-respect. The embarrassed League had no choice but to give him the podium. Italian journalists heaped upon him the final and most humiliating indignity. Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le... After the Italian journalist Hector's were ejected from the hall, Haile Selassie continued, and he said this, It is international morality that is at stake. Apart from the kingdom of the Lord, there is not on this earth any nation which is superior to any other. It is us today, it will be you tomorrow. The wisdom and prophetic nature of Haile Selassie's speech at the League of Nations went unheeded. The world listened but did nothing, paralyzed by insecurity and fear of fascist military strength. By turning our backs on the Abyssinian War, the United States refused to face the fact that Mussolini's takeover of the primitive African nation was no different from traditional European colonization. Our reluctance to strongly oppose outright aggression in 35, simply because an ocean separated us, was a policy that gratified both Hitler and Mussolini, as well as American pacifists and isolationists. The Neutrality Act of 1935, which prohibited the shipment of arms to belligerents, helped assure the victory of Italy's well-equipped modern army. The ease with which Italy overpowered Ethiopia was a signal to fascist dictators that democratic nations would not resist their urge for conquest with anything but words. Ethiopia set the stage for European conquest. Mr. O'Connor. What is your real name? Malcolm. Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. Have you been to court to establish the I don't. I, I didn't have to go to court to be called Murphy or Jones or Smith. Excuse me for answering you this way. That's if all right. a Chinese person were to say his name was Patrick Murphy, uh, you would look at him like he's insane because uh, Murphy is an Irish name, uh, a European name, or the name that uh, has a Caucasian or, or a white background. And a yellow person, Chinese is a yellow man, and uh, he has nothing to do or no connection whatsoever with the name Murphy. And if it doesn't look proper for a person who is yellow or Chinese to be walking around named Murphy or Jones or Johnson or Bunch or Powell, uh, I think it would be just as improper for a black person or the so-called Negro in this country, as we're taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to walk around with these names. And therefore, he teaches us that during slavery, the same slave master who owned us uh, put his last name on us to denote that we were his property. So that when you see a Negro today who's named Johnson, if you go back in his history, you'll find that he was once his grandfather or one of his forefathers was owned by a white man who was named Johnson. His name is Bunch. His, his grandfather was owned by a I white man point. that was uh, named Bunch. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. 
My father got his last name from his grandfather, and his grandfather got it from his grandfather, who got it from the slave master. The real names of our people were destroyed well, during slavery. Any, was there any line, uh, any point in, in the uh, genealogy of your family when you did have to use the last name? And if so, what was it? The last name of my forefathers yeah. was taken from them when they were brought to America and made slaves. And then the name of the slave master was given, which we refuse. We reject that name today. You mean, you, mean to... you won't even tell me what your father's supposed last name was or gifted last name was? I never acknowledge it whatsoever. Let me ask you about the, the status of Elijah Muhammad. First of all, is he ill? I spoke to him today. He is in better health than he has been. He's suffering from asthmatic bronchitis. Is that why he didn't attend your rally on last Tuesday? Yeah, the only reason that he didn't attend was his uh, ill condition. And the weather here, especially on that particular day, was of such nature that it would have been almost insane for him to come. Well, now, did you hold that meeting last Tuesday because it coincided with the uh, general election, the primary election? I think if you study the history of Mr. Muhammad's work and religious work in this country, he's been, we've had our convention on February the 26th every year for, I think, the past 33 years. Well, now, while, while you don't uh, care to discuss your former name or the name that the slave master gave to your antecedents, uh, it is a matter of record that uh, Muhammad's last name was Poole, Elijah Poole. No, that's the name that his slave master gave to his uh, grandfather or great-grandfather, but that's not his name. Well, his mother and father thought when they called him Elijah Poole that that was his name. They right? didn't know any better. Well, if they didn't know any better or not, that, they thought that was his name. Yes, sir, but sir... Well, what I'm trying to find out is when did he cease to be Elijah Poole and get to be Elijah Muhammad? In 1931, I think it was, in Detroit, he was taught the true history of our people and made aware at that time that he was wearing an English name, and by not being an Englishman, he looked out of place. And uh, his teacher gave him the name that he's wearing today, Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad. All right, now when did he become what he purports to be in your literature, the son of Allah? I've never heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad referred to as the son the of Allah. The prophet of Allah. Okay. I've never heard him referred to as the prophet of Allah. What do you refer to him Messenger as? of Allah. All right, the messenger of Allah, and I appreciate the correction. Yes, I mean, he says that a prophet is somebody who predicts the future and he's not predicting the future, whereas a messenger is someone who carries a message that has been given to him by one who authors that message. Well, now who gave him the message and to whom is it supposed to be delivered? Master W.F. Muhammad, the one who taught him, is the author of the message. He gave it to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, which makes him the messenger. And he's to deliver that message of truth and righteousness to the 20 million American so-called Negroes, which means he's to teach us the truth, which will awaken us, and then show us how to live a life of righteousness, which will automatically qualify us for recognition as human beings by all other righteous human beings here on this earth. Well, now, one other question. Uh, with reference to what Mr. Hurlbut asked you a little bit ago, uh, you took a very moderate position of... Uh, of wanting independence without having any hatred for the for the whites is that is, do I understand that correctly hatred is not involved in it whatsoever well I recall uh, in a recent plane crash I mean two or three years ago or less than that a charter flight on Air France uh, in which a group of people from Atlanta Georgia uh, were as they say in the uh, business uh, as they took off from uh, from Arley Field, and you were quoted at that time as expressing great gratification that this tragedy had occurred. Do you recall that? I recall it. What uh, did you say? Was, Do you remember? Uh, the press misinterpreted it and misrepresented it. What did you say? They said that it was made at a Muslim meeting. It wasn't. It was made at a rally of Negroes, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, and otherwise in Los Angeles, who were rallying to protest the brutal shooting of uh, seven unarmed Negroes and what did you by say? heavily armed white policemen in the city of Los Angeles. And because we are a people who have been taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to never carry weapons of any kind, but to get on God's side and rely on God to fight our battles for us, uh, at the time that these brothers were shot down so brutally, I pointed out at the <laughs> funeral of the brother who died that God would step in and take a hand in giving us some form of justice for the brutal killing of our brother. 
And when the plane crashed in France, uh, I pointed out to the crowd at this rally that this was an act of God showing his wrath or complete uh, resentment over the brutal uh, form of injustice that had been inflicted upon our poor unarmed brothers. Were you saying Sir, that or do Billy you believe Graham, that? At that time, Dr. Billy Graham was in a crusade in Chicago. And the press, your papers here in this city, uh, quoted Billy Graham of also saying that that pl uh, plane crash was an act of God. And if you take time to check the newspapers, I think that you'll find that this is correct. But no one thought that Billy Graham was so wrong when he attributed the crash of this plane to his God. But when we say that it come from our God, then we're looked upon as being, well, you know, that, outrageous. I know, but you took the position that uh, this was a matter of satisfaction to you for I don't an think injustice that, done against you, and I think that that's a trifle severe. We did not think that it was a coincidence that 120 of, of the whites on this plane came from the state of Georgia, a state that has the worst record in history in the history of America for the mistreatment of black people uh, in this country. Worse than Mississippi? Uh, well, uh, they maybe are a little less... Uh, Mississippi is a little less hypocritical today than Georgia, but both of them are still practicing the same thing. Uh, now the, the whites in Georgia bite Negroes with a smile, whereas they used to bite them with a growl. But they're still being bitten, and we don't think that it, that it is any worse to be bitten with a smile than it is to be bitten with a growl. Mr. Calvert. While we're on the subject of uh, Mississippi, what is uh, your organization's position of what happened in Mississippi uh, in the past Such six Such as months? what? such as the uh, James Meredith incident and the enrollment of him in the university. Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants justice for every one of the 20 million so-called Negroes. And to just take one Negro and stick him in, in college uh, with, uh, with the aid of the six, I think it's six, uh, 15,000 troops and at a cost of $6,000 is a disgrace. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a farce. It's hypocrisy. Because if it's right for uh, one Negro to be forced into that university, then every Negro in the state of Mississippi who is qualified has the same right to go to that university. And if the government is not uh, ready and willing to uh, enforce the right of every Negro in the state of Mississippi, then uh, in my opinion, sir, it's only hypocrisy to pretend that uh, they are for justice uh, by pushing one Negro in and blowing it up all over the world to make it look like they're solving the problem when millions of black people in that state are still going to uh, segregated schools and getting an inferior education. Does your organization encourage members to uh, uh, attempt to enter schools that have been known as all white? And all uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad doesn't discourage us from attending white schools, but he does say that uh, it is better for us to go to our own schools and after we have a thorough knowledge of ourselves, of our own kind, and uh, racial dignity has been uh, instilled within us, then we can go to anyone's school and we'll still retain our race pride, our racial dignity, and we will be able to avoid the subservient inferiority complex that most Negroes have or are, that is instilled within most Negroes who receive this sort of integrated education. You were born in Omaha, is that right? Yes, sir. And you left, your family left Omaha when you were what, one year old? I imagine about a year old. And why did they leave Omaha? Well, to my understanding, uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, burned down one of their homes in, uh, in, uh, in Omaha. This, a lot of Ku Klux this Klan. made your family feel very unhappy, I'm sure. Well, insecure, if not unhappy. So you must have a somewhat prejudiced point of view, a personally prejudiced point of view. In other words, you cannot look at this in a broad academic sort of way, really. I, I, I think that's incorrect because uh, despite the fact that that happened in Omaha and then when we moved to Lansing, Michigan, our home was burned down again. In fact, my father was killed by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and despite all of that, no one was more thoroughly integrated with whites than I. No one has lived more so in the society of whites than I. And uh, it was only until I became a Muslim that I ceased living in the society You say you are thoroughly integrated with the whites. Oh, yes. are, do you have white people in your family background? Definitely. Most Negroes in this country have whites in their family background. How, because how are you going to differentiate between the white blood that's in you and the Negro blood that's in you? And you don't mind my using the no, Negro, but well, did you use this yourself? I use it interchangeably. I know you do. Uh, Why do you do that? Well, I use it uh, if it fits the purpose to use it, but I, I use see. it against my will. Do you? Uh, but you, I use use it against it, you, my... you used it uh, voluntarily in describing the incident in Los Angeles. Still, so, I use it against my will. I guess the teachings weren't <laughs> thoroughly inculcated. No, right? but when I say to you that the uh, cops in Los Angeles shot down seven unarmed Negroes, mm -hmm. every Negro in the audience knows what I'm talking about. But when I say that he shot, that they shot 
uh, seven uh, Muslims, then a lot of the Negroes don't realize. I suppose that you said seven colored Negroes. people because you say you use the term colored people. You said I don't think I use the word colored. colored on this program. Yes, you did. You did only not colored. Out. I think so. Black people. I'm sorry. You black. Did say black. Well, we can use black, and that fits everybody. <laughs> okay. But sir, the black. Now let me get back to another point that you made. You said that uh, you go back home. Now, what do you mean by back home? I've only heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say, back among our own people. From you whence said we... back home. You yes. don't mind my saying Right, that. back home. But by that he you, means... Do you mean back into uh, the uh, roots of, is of uh, Islam, or do you mean back to Africa? Back home. And Africa. by back home he means back into our original uh, civilization. And if you study history, the Islamic culture existed in West Africa, But your Central family Africa. didn't come from uh, an Isla Islamic background originally, did it? I mean, you came from, from the proud tribes of Africa, which is I think you find, sir, that one of the, background. that Islam, the Islamic culture... A, I agree, there is a, ...existed a lot widely of, in Africa, Central well, Africa, agree, West Africa. I agree, I've met many people in there. Mr. O'Connor. With regard to that uh, tragedy out there in Los Angeles, uh, I myself refer to it when it happened as the tragic police action, so I am not totally biased. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming from uh, Muhammad Speaks, which is the publication of your, uh, your cult or your religion, uh, Elijah Poole, Elijah Muhammad, uh, referred to the policemen out there, the white policemen, as devils. Uh, he said, there is no justice here for us black people. There is no future for us nor our children in civilized America. Uh, doesn't that uh, imply that you're going to get out or that's his wish that you get out? If he referred to those policemen out there as devils who, had, who were heavily armed and knew that the, men, the Negroes whom they were shooting down in cold blood were not heavily armed, I don't think that those policemen themselves would deny that they're devils, nor would any Negro who witnessed such a deed deny that they are devils. Well, about the other part of it, there's no justice here for us black people. There's no future for us, nor our children in civilized America. And I didn't make that up. He, he said it in his own... He, and he's correct in what he says, sir. Well, what does it mean? Does uh, it mean you're going to get out or It what? means the same thing that Attorney General Robert Kennedy means when he says that the number one domestic problem in America is the race problem. That it is almost impossible to solve it. It's almost impossible to give justice to Negroes. What has been the growth of the Muslim movement? There are conflicting reports as to how many Muslims there are in the United States. Can you tell us? Well, most critics say that the dissatisfied follow Muhammad, that the unemployed and the oppressed follow Muhammad. And I think you'll agree the sociologists, the economists, and other experts say that the masses of black people are dissatisfied, unemployed, oppressed, and fed up. So that he actually gets his support uh, at the mass level. But now you have other Negroes at the class level who pretend not to go for him because usually their job uh, has been given to them by the white man. They, are, they have positions to which they have been appointed and they uh, think that the only way that they can protect their job is by pretending in, the front, in front of the white man that they don't go for Mr. Muhammad either. But you well, find how, how many Muslims do you say there are in, the, in numbers? I couldn't say. I've never heard him say and he's the only one who would know. 500,000? I couldn't say. Uh, I think that uh, anyone who does say is not in a position to know, and anyone who knows wouldn't say. What do you think that uh, the Urban League and the uh, NAACP have accomplished for your people? What's your well, attitude Well, in their them? own way, they have been doing their best to bring about freedom, justice, and equality, and human dignity for the black people in this country. But today you have such a, uh, an intense degree of dissatisfaction and impatience existing among our people at the mass level that it is almost impossible to come to them with a program that's going to take another hundred years to solve their problem and they still be satisfied to wait. So that they have, the Urban League and the NAACP has done a good job within their understanding. But today it takes uh, more uh, uh, immediate solutions. And the solution that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has is immediate. It's and more you think they're not moving fast enough? Well, they're moving as fast as they can. But that's not fast enough for the masses of black people. If a person is sitting on a warm stove and you get ready to let him up, no matter how slow you are, he has patience because he, it's only warm. But the masses of black people who are sitting on a hot stove, they're impatient. And no matter how fast you say progress is being made toward letting them up, that progress is not fast enough for them. Well, the NAACP and the Urban League have both been critical of the of the Muslims. The NAACP and Urban League have been maneuvered into criticizing us against their own will. Usually, the, the divide-and-conquer tactics have always been used by the oppressor to keep the oppressed oppressed. 
and the NAACP has been used against the Muslims. Efforts have been made to use us against them, but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says he'll work with the NAACP, the Urban League, and any other Negro organization that wants to uplift the black man as long as it doesn't conflict with our religious principles. Well, I remember once when Elijah was quoted as having said that the Urban League and the NAACP sold out to the white man. Has he ever made that statement uh, to To you? my knowledge, I don't think that he has said that uh, they sold out to the white man. I've heard him say that. Is that his feeling? Uh, the, the NAACP has been in existence for 54 years. And, for, and they, they elect a new national president every year, and they have never elected a black man to sit in that capacity. Arthur Spingarn has been president of the NAACP for 24 years. And so in this sense, it means that either they're practicing the same discrimination that they accuse the white man of practicing, they're practicing it themselves, or else they're not qualifying other Negroes in that organization for the positions of leadership. This is our only criticism. I you personally that? feel that they have sold out to the white man? Those You personally feel that those organizations have sold out to the white man? I don't think that uh, they would knowingly allow themselves to be used or misused against their own people. So if they are failing to do the job that, their pe that our people are expect of them, probably it's just through lack of understanding. But today their understanding is increasing and you'll find that they're developing a, a better ability to work with all different factions for the betterment of our people. Uh, Malcolm, how do you yourself feel about the white man? I believe that the white man has done a great injustice to the black man in this country mm -hmm. by having kidnapped our people and, uh, and brought us here and down to the level that we're on today. And today, instead of approaching the factors that their uh, or original mistake has created, Instead of approaching these factors objectively and realistically, the greatest sin that they're doing now is trying, to buy, is trying to pretend that they never committed a crime, that they never did any wrong. And when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad points out the injustices that our people are suffering, this, they, they, they uh, make that sin worse by accusing him of teaching hate or by accusing him of, of uh, black supremacy or by accusing him of advocating violence simply because he is pointing out the we, real we, factors we, we in the problem. Little, we have a little time left. You don't have to hurry so much, Malcolm. <laughs> uh, one white man named Lincoln uh, supposedly fought the Civil War to solve the race problem, and the problem is still here. Another white man named Lincoln, again, the same white man, issued the Emancipation Proclamation to solve the race problem, and the problem is still here. Some more white liberals came along with the 13th, 14th, and 5th Amendments, which were, which were supposed to solve the race problem, and the problem is still here. Uh, nine years ago, nine more white liberals, so-called, came up with what they call a Supreme Court desegregation decision, and the problem is still here. And then another white man named Kennedy came along running for president and told Negro what all he was going to do for them if they voted for him and they voted for him 80 percent he's been in office now for three years and the problem is still here when the police dogs were biting uh, black women and black children and black babies in Birmingham Alabama that Kennedy talked about what he couldn't do because no federal law had been in, uh, violated and as soon as the Negroes exploded and began to protect themselves and got the best of the crackers in Birmingham then Kennedy sent for the troops and there was no he uh, he used, he didn't have any new law when he sent for the troops when the Negroes erupted than he had at the time when whites were erupting. So we are within our rights and with justice, with justification, when we uh, express doubt concerning the ability of the white man to solve our problem and also when we express doubt concerning his integrity, concerning his, his sincerity. Because you will have to confess that the problem has been around here for a long time, and whites have been saying the same thing about it for the past hundred years, and there's no nearer a solution today than there was a hundred years ago. Who taught you, please? Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such extent that you bleach to get like the white man? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate, you should ask who yourself who taught you to hate being what God gave you.
We teach you to love the hair that God gave you. Here you way out in the middle of the ocean, can't swim, and you worried about someone that's in the bathtub and can't swim. We don't steal, we don't gamble, we don't lie, and we don't cheat. And that also deprives the government of revenue. <laughs> Because you can't get into a whiskey bottle without getting past the government seal. You can't open a deck of cards without getting past the government seal. There's a white man makes the whiskey and then puts you in jail for getting drunk. He sells you the cards and the dice and puts you in jail when he gets you using them. So he's against us because we fix it where he can't catch you anymore. We take the dice out of your hands, and the cards out of your hands, and the whiskey out of your head. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected one, a person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. And as Muslims, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us to respect our women and to protect our women. And the only time a Muslim really gets real violent is when someone goes to molest his woman. We will kill you for our woman. I'm, I'm making it plain, yes. We will kill you for our woman. We believe that if the white man will do whatever is necessary to see that his woman gets respect and protection, then you and I will never be recognized as men until we stand up like men and place the same penalty over the head of anyone who puts his filthy hands out to put in the direction of our women. My personal political philosophy, black nationalism, which means that the black man should control the politics of his own community and control the politicians who are in his own community. My personal economic philosophy is uh, also black nationalism, which means that the black man should have a hand in controlling the economy of the so-called Negro community. He should be developing the type of knowledge that will enable him to own and operate the businesses and thereby be able to create employment for his own people, for his own kind. And the uh, social philosophy also is black nationalism, which means that instead of the black man trying to force himself into the society of the white man, we should be trying to eliminate from our own society the ills and the, the defects and make ourselves uh, likable and sociable among our, among our own kind. Well, you seem to be dissatisfied with everything. Just what do you want? I'm not dissatisfied with everything. I'm, you, what you are able to see with your analytical mind is that everything that is offered doesn't produce what it's supposed to produce. And I'm just telling you that it doesn't produce what, it produce, what it's supposed to produce. Well, what is your ultimate aim? The only way the problem can be solved, first, the white man and the black man have to be able to sit down at the same table. The white man has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of that Negro. And the so-called Negro has to feel free to speak his mind without hurting the feelings of the white man. Then they can bring the issues that are under the rug out on top of the table and take an intelligent approach to get the problem solved. That's the only way that they'll ever do it. We need an action program while we are Muslim, and while, while we are Christian, or while we are whatever we are. We still need an action program that will eliminate these evils that are in our community. And this is what we're trying to do with the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Do you consider yourself militant? <laughs> I consider myself Malcolm.